All right, so welcome to lesson four, the regulation of blood sugar. In this lesson, we're going to start to really tie in some of the aspects and specific details of how specific hormones and how specific homeostatic mechanisms function, utilize the, the concepts and ideas that we've learned over the past couple of units, and also how it starts to connect into some ideas of the human anatomy and physiology, specifically with regards to, again, how that blood sugar is regulated. Because again, when you think about aerobic respiration, when you think about how the kidneys function, when you think about unit one through through what we've learned today, all of it is is in an attempt to look at the bigger picture and how that glucose can be metabolized with regards to aerobic respiration and then how some of that glucose production and how that glucose storage is, is managed. So when we think about that glucose utilization of all cells as a fuel for that cellular respiration, we really need to consider how the endocrine system can regulate that blood sugar because again, uh, depending on how much blood sugar you are taking in and how much you are storing and how much you are using, uh, homeostatic mechanisms need to kind of uh, set that standard, so to speak. So that homeostasis is not maintained necessarily due to that insufficient or improper working systems. Uh, people may need to otherwise measure and regulate homeostasis on their own. Again, when we looked at diabetes as a brief interlude yesterday in some of those notes, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the specifics of how that works as a whole. So when we take a look at the structure of the pancreas, we need to recognize that there are two main hormones involved with regards to it. And those two main hormones are insulin and glucagon. And these are both going to be responsible for um, kind of regulating that blood sugar. And they're both produced by that pancreas organ that we briefly talked about a little bit yesterday in some notes, as well as uh, couple of units ago where we talked about, again, aerobic respiration in some capacity. So another major contributor with regards to the hormone aspect is something called glucocorticosteroids or glucocorticosteroids. And the, these will be discussed a little bit later when we learn about the body's response to stress, specifically in the stress response lesson with, uh, I think that's our last lesson on our final day of lessons that count towards assessment, so this Friday. So we'll talk a little about those glucocorticoids uh, and I'll explain how they are related to stress response and we'll go from there. So recall, the pancreas is considered an accessory organ of the digestive system. If you recall from grade 11 biology, you must have learned all the organs and accessory organ systems with regards to digestion. Its main function, or the majority of the organ is responsible for the exocrine gland response. So it's going to make those digestive chemicals and it's going to release them into the small intestine. So it's releasing products into a body cavity or an environment, right? Endocrine is releasing it directly into a bloodstream or into the uh, interstitial fluid. And that exocrine is that direct release of a product into a cavity or a specific environment. So the focus of the pancreas that we will talk about are something called the islet of Langerhans. And they're a group of cells that are responsible, again, for that endocrine specific response. So we look at the pancreas as a whole as an exocrine, right? An exocrine gland. But the islet of Langerhans are a group of cells that are endocrine cells. So they're going to release hormones directly into the bloodstream. So it's important to recognize that there are several components of that pancreas that you have to be able to consider it. So the pancreas functions as an exocrine gland but there are islet of Langerhans that are responsible for the endocrine cells or the endocrine components, again, directly into the bloodstream. So these cells are going to be about 2% of the entire pancreas. So while 98% of the pancreas in this context is an exocrine gland responsible for those specific digestive chemicals, those islet of Langerhans are 2% of that pancreas and they function as an endocrine cell. And these cells contain two specialized cells. And we're going to talk a little bit about them today, the alpha cells and beta cells. And I'll use these symbols to kind of signify these types of cells because they, they perform different roles. But again, it's all in that, uh, all under that umbrella of an endocrine component. So let's take a look at the hormones that control the metabolism of glucose and fuels in general within the body. Because now we can start to tie in, again, I feel like I say this all the time for every unit, but we can really start to tie in some of the concepts that we've learned in previous units to the things that we're consistently learning every day. And, and this is one of them. So 
when you think about examples of uh, peptide hormones, you're going to look at both being an example of peptide hormones produced by the islet of Langerhans. And these cells, again, in that pancreas are going to produce these soluble in blood and they're going to bind to cell surface receptacles or cell surface receptors. So peptide hormones, recall from yesterday, they're soluble in blood, bind to cell surface receptors. They're not actually entering the cells to affect the change. They are binding to a protein or protein structures on the cells to encourage that change. So the first one we're going to look at is insulin. These are produced and secreted by the beta cells of the pancreas, the beta cells of the pancreas. It lowers blood sugars. It's lowering blood sugar concentration. This allows the cells to absorb glucose. Okay. It allows the cells to absorb glucose and its target cells include skeletal muscles, the liver and adipose cells or fat. When we, talk, when we talk about fat, we'll talk about it as an important energy source in this context. We don't go into too specific of details of it. But the most important thing you need to recognize with regards to insulin is it's produced by those beta cells. And it's in an attempt to lower blood glucose concentration. And this allow, is allowing cells to absorb that glucose. And I'll let you think about that and digest it a little bit because that's important connection to make to that. Uh, and we'll, we'll come back to that idea often. So... How it works, it will instruct that target cell to uptake glucose, okay? It's gonna target, that, uh, that target cell is gonna instruct it to say, hey, take in glucose, okay? And as a result of it taking in that glucose, again, it will lower blood glucose concentration. The blood glucose concentration is high, the cells get told by insulin to take that glucose in, as a result of that absorption or that uptake of glucose into the cells, we're lowering blood glucose. I'm going to probably hammer that idea to absolute death with regards to insulin. But again, it's crucial that you recognize the actual connection between the response to insulin and the actual lowering of blood glucose concentration in, in the blood. So the lower, this lowers amino acid levels in the blood by promoting uptake while inhibiting breakdown of proteins into amino acids. And so it has two functions. And, and just like I want to say, Sarmad, you asked it yesterday, uh, how do these hormones work? How many functions do they have? With regards to insulin, you can already start to see the multifaceted um, approach that it can take. It not only instructs target cells to uptake that glucose, but it's going to lower amino acid levels in the blood by promoting that uptake as well. And it's going to inhibit the breakdown of proteins into amino acids. And again, this is very important because you don't want to use proteins as fuel because proteins perform many, 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 many different functions within the cell. And the cells need those proteins and those amino acids to build up and to utilize to create the necessary structures that they can benefit from. So again, please be mindful when we're talking about insulin, the beta cells of the pancreas, it's going to lower blood glucose concentration as a result of instructing cells to uptake glucose from the blood. Another aspect that I want to talk about in, in, in the adipose cells or those fatty tissues is it's going to lower fatty acid levels in the blood by promoting fatty acid uptake. So what this means is that it's going to also inhibit the breakdowns of fat into fatty acids. So it's going to allow for fat storage. This is a important concept to recognize when you tie into the idea of if the blood glucose level is high, right? If that blood glucose level is high, insulin will be released. And in that attempt to, to utilize all that glucose in, in, the blood, in the bloodstream as a result of, of that meal that you've had or, or whatever reason it might be, it really wants to store it and utilize it as best as possible. So not only is it, is it inhibiting that breakdown of protein, but also causing that glucose to be pulled into the cells. It's also causing those fatty acid levels in the blood to uh, decrease as a result of fatty acid uptake by those adipose cells. And it will say, hey, don't break down fat, store that fat, store that fat for later usage. And then lastly, with regards to the liver, insulin will inhibit the breakdown of glycogen. We'll talk about what that is as we move forward. But glycogen is a large glucose polymer, again, storage of sugars. So it's going to inhibit that breakdown of glycogen into glucose. And again, why would it do that? Because there's a large concentration of glucose within that 
blood, uh, that blood within the blood. You know, when you go around the blood, that blood glucose concentration is high. Forget breaking down anything else that the cells could use for energy. Just utilize that glucose. Glycogen is not to be mistaken with glucagon, which is the next hormone that we're going to talk about. Glucagon is produced and secreted by those alpha cells of the pancreas, the alpha cells of the pancreas. And it will increase blood glucose concentration. So when you think about the parallels between glucagon and insulin, you can start to see those connections of, of if you were to compare and contrast those ideas, and, and I, I misspoke, they're not connections, but if you were to compare and contrast the idea of glucogen, glucagon and insulin, recognize that one is secreted by the alpha cells in glucagon and that it increases blood glucose concentration, whereas insulin does the opposite and is secreted by those beta cells. So as I stated, it has the opposite effect of insulin. It's going to simu stimulate breakdown of glycogen, protein, and fatty acids. This is what happens when you fast. When you fast, it's going to break down all of those aspects of storage, uh, stored sugars or stored molecules. And its goal is to break these down into glucose as well as, or in order to utilize them as fuels during periods of fasting. Intermediates that can enter cellulose respiration, right? So again, when you think about the, uh, the structure of glycogen, proteins, and fatty acids, which we'll kind of look at a little bit later, they can be utilized as intermediates that can enter cellular respiration. We don't talk too much about those specifics uh, simply because it is a very complex mechanism that it is, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's a very complex mechanism. Uh, so we won't get into too much specific details about it, but ultimately that is a goal of glucagon. So when we think about negative feedback regulation in homeostasis, and again, recall from lesson one, that aspect of negative feedback is, is consistent in homeostasis because we're always looking at increasing or decreasing a value to that norm, right? Positive feedback continues to increase a value and consistently increasing it, whereas negative feedback remove or uh, increases or decreases it to that norm. So alpha and beta cells respond to blood glucose level by producing glycogen and glucose as needed by responding to levels of glucose within their cytosol. So that cytosol of those alpha and beta cells is, is kind of sampling, if you will, for those of you who have taken data management or are taking data management, it's sampling the cytosol and it's saying, okay, there is, based on what's con uh, the concentration of those alpha and beta cells, there's X or Y amount of glucose in the blood. We use that information to determine which type of hormones to release. So when you look at after eating or after fasting, I'll look at after eating on the left first. After eating, the islet of Langerhans are going to really determine that blood sugar level, right? Those alpha beta cells are taking in that information and based on high blood glucose, we're gonna see a negative inhibition of those alpha cells the amount of glucagon decreases, and then we're going to have a blood glucose decrease as a result, because again, glucagon increases blood glucose level. On that same note, we now have some positive feedback that happens, right? Now, uh, those beta cells are going to recognize that there is a high amount of glucose within the blood sugar. They're going to release lots of insulin as a result, and it will continue to do so, right? It'll continue to do so as that insulin value and, blood and glucose increase, it's going to increase more insulin production and release. So now we're starting to see that glucose decrease in the blood sugar after that fact. So even though there is some positive feedback involved, the overall aspect is negative feedback regulation because it's going to initially increase that concentration of insulin, but ultimately, eventually, we're going to reduce that blood glucose level back down to that normal homeostatic amount. When you look at after fasting and, and a low blood glucose, we're just looking at the reverse of that first uh, reaction or that first feedback loop, right? The whole premise is that we are going to take that glycogen, glycogen and make it into glucose in an attempt to utilize as a energy source. So just like with our after eating, instead of the alpha cells being negatively inhibited, we're looking at those alpha cells being positively inhibited. And then the beta cells have that negative inhibition we see an increase in glucagon, a decrease in insulin, and it's again, all in an attempt to make that blood glucose level back down to that normal amount. In this case, we're increasing the glucose amount. In that after eating component, we're decreasing the glucose amount. 
So when you think about throughout your entire day and, and the food and the, the material and nutrients that you take in, blood glucose level is not constant. When we eat meals, blood glucose spikes. When we fast, levels will decrease significantly. Again, this is in a, a non-diabetic, perfectly healthy person. So concentration of insulin in the blood is much smaller than that of glucose. Okay, The concentration of insulin in the blood is much smaller than that of glucose. But glucose and insulin should rise and fall at the same time throughout the day. Response to these meals uh, and fasting is the main reason. And if they do not rise and fall together, this may lead to certain conditions or this may be as a result of certain conditions. Uh, and again, now we'll talk about some more aspects of diabetes because it is important to recognize. So diabetes mellitus is uh, under three categories and it can involve, it basically it involves the failure of cells to regulate that blood glucose level for multiple various reasons. Uh, they involve a failure in insulin production specifically and usually, uh, and in some cases it can involve glucagon production issues. So what are some early symptoms of the three types? Uh, the first is frequent urina urination. If those cells aren't taking in glucose, levels in the blood of, are going to be abnormally high, and it's going to result in abnormally high concentration within the kidneys, and it's going to have little reabsorption as a result of that, because if it's not reabsorbing that glucose, right, because of the high concentration of it, it's going to keep a lot of water in that, um, in the nephrons and in that filtrate, and you're going to have to urinate off. So that high concentration of glucose in the kidneys pulls more water, right, into that nephron. And it's going to lead to that water, or again, that water is attracted by glucose. It's going to lead to more frequent urination. It's also going to increase um, how thirsty you are. Because if you're increasing urination, the body is losing too much water and you're going to be thirsty. So it's going to cause dehydration. And this dehydration has an impact on other factors. Because when you look at the hypothalamus as a whole, and it senses that blood concentration, it will trigger that release of ADH, and it will continue to try to save as much of your water as humanly possible. So you really start, when we look at the nervous system and the hypothalamus as a whole, you can start to make some of those connections overall. Uh, but ultimately, we now have an increase in thirst, frequent urination. And then lastly, we have an increase in appetite. And, uh, and that note there is just that antidiuretic hormone it's going to try to increase that H2O absorption in the kidneys, right? Uh, but now the third thing, we're going to see an increase in appetite. Cells are not getting enough glucose as a result of that excess glucose not being uptake, uptaken by the cells, and it's going to be urinated out quite frequently. So they begin to break down other macromolecules. And those other macromolecules, as we discussed, are like fats and protein. This can cause an increase in hunger for these specific types of nutrients. So glucose is stuck in the blood. Cells cannot get access to it and therefore they are starved. So they're really craving more, uh, more of those macromolecules. So some short-term effects involve fatigue, abdominal pains, dizziness, nausea, and blurred vision. And some long-term effects are hypertension or high blood pressure. And this can lead to damage of the blood vessels as well as eventually the organs within the body. Uh, so it's uh, important to recognize these signs. Um, it's also important to recognize that uh, even if you have any and all of these, I, I, would, I always tell this to any of my students, uh, teenagers, they are allowed to have an increase in appetite and as a result, they can be quite thirsty for or dehydrated. And that's okay. It doesn't necessarily mean you have some type of diabetes, but if you are concerned about that, any and all of that stuff, um, I always say, I am not a doctor. No one in this class is a doctor. No one in your school is a doctor go speak to a doctor if you feel like you have some concerns about any or all of those things. So what are the three types of diabetes mellitus? So when you think about the aspects of type one and type two diabetes, these are the first two types of diabetes. Uh, type one diabetes is genetic or juvenile. Uh, this is as a result of some type of genetic disorder or some type of um, mistranscription translation of those uh, necessary proteins or necessary structures of those beta cells uh, that are responsible for administering insulin. And for whatever reason, those beta cells don't work properly. So we see a decrease in insulin in the blood vessels. We see an increase in glucose due to low insulin. And then as a result of that, all of those processes will follow as a result of that decrease in insulin. In type two diabetes, which is called the lifestyle uh, diabetes, uh, we look at aspects of beta cells are functional, 
uh, they just straight up don't make enough insulin for the diet uh, that the, the person has undertaken. Uh, so there's what's called insulin resistance, meaning that there's so much glucose in the body uh, as a result of diet and not enough exercise, essentially, that even though that insulin exists, uh, there's just such a huge amount of glucose in the blood system that those cells aren't able to uptake it quickly enough and utilize it because of that sedentary lifestyle. Uh, so there are factors like obesity that take into consideration this. Uh, there are some genetic components as well as other factors that lead to insulin resistance, uh, but it's usually referred to as the lifestyle type 2 diabetes because if you eat less or change your diet to a bit more of a healthy standard and exercise more, uh, in many cases it can mitigate and even uh, cure some of these aspects of that type 2 diabetes. So we'll talk more about that below. So when we compare these types of diabetes, uh, again, we talked about type 1 and type 2. I'll talk about gestational afterwards. But that type 1 diabetes, those beta cells of the islet of Langerhans are not able to produce any insulin. These are the type of people that need to monitor their blood sugar level. And they have to take that insulin that we talked about a couple of units ago, or last unit, I would say, uh, that get produced by bacteria and then purified by uh, medical professionals and pharmaceutical professionals. And then that insulin can then be used to kind of help that, um, to help with that blood sugar uptake, right? It's usually due to the genetic link uh, component. If it runs in your family, there's a risk for you to have that. And uh, again, like I mentioned, you have to monitor your blood glucose level. There need to be injections of insulin into your system. It is a non-curable disease as of today. Then the type 2 diabetes that, or that lifestyle diabetes, uh, it usually happens in adulthood. Uh, diet high in sugar, low exercise, stress are all factors that cause it. And a healthier diet plus exercise as well as some pharmaceuticals uh, can help to reverse those effects. It can be seen as curable uh, as a result of those modifications we talked about. And the last one is uh, gest gestational diabetes. Uh, it's interesting because the placenta releases types of hormones that can cause blood glucose levels to rise or skyrocket. Um, it usually happens at 24 weeks plus within that third trimester. Uh, the mother makes her regular insulin amount, uh, and, and that's kind of what causes some of those factors to maybe contribute to it. Uh, in, order to treatment, in order to treat it, you have to monitor the mother's blood and then modify some of her diet. Um, but it can be something that doesn't necessarily get passed on. It's just something that can be, needs to be managed in that moment. So there's a little investigation for you to take a look at here and then homework section 10.3. Uh, but with regards to the lesson itself, that is complete. I'll be more than happy to answer any and all questions in the chat. Uh, and so I'll stop recording here.